Hey guys, welcome to this week's FAQ in Freebie Friday. Now before we begin, if you're new to our YouTube channel, these videos are all about answering your health related questions. So if you have a question concerning your health, something regarding diet or nutrition, supplements, herbs, or really anything pertaining to health and wellness, and you would like our help in answering your questions, all you have to do is leave those questions in the comment section below, and we'll be answering those based on popularity, the questions that we feel are gonna be the most beneficial and interesting to the group overall, and of course, questions that we are capable of answering. And something else really great about these videos is that every week from the comment section, we select one lucky person to win a free bag of tonic herbs or medicinal mushrooms. So even if you don't have a health question for us this week, but you're interested in winning some free herbs, all you have to do is simply subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet already, give this video a thumbs up, and then just drop any comment in the comment section below. And with that being said, let's get to this week's questions. Okay, so looking at our first question, this is an interesting question, and it reads, mitigating ashwagandha and ginkgo biloba's activation of the cholerogenic system to still reap their remarkable benefits, question mark. So first and foremost, for those of you that do not know, the cholerogenic system is another term for the parasympathetic system. So you might be familiar with this term. It is a branch of our central nervous system. There are two primary branches, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic. Now these branches have their own functions in the body when activated. So the sympathetic usually refers to the stress system. It usually is what activates all of the excitatory processes that are involved in stress. So this is why it gets the term or the name the fight or flight system because typically when you are in a state of stress of any degree and your body's secreting cortisol and adrenaline, your sympathetic nervous system is activated which drives up your heart rate and your body temperature and prepares your body to fight or fight, literally. So being sympathetically dominant can obviously result in tons of health issues, things like anxiety, nervousness, and a lot of stress-related symptoms. Now on the other hand, the parasympathetic nervous system has sort of opposing effects to that of the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is what activates rest, relaxation, and digestion, which is why it gets its nickname, the rest and digest nervous system. However, there is such a thing as being parasympathetically dominant. The overactivation of the cholerogenic system can be excitotoxic. It can stimulate the excess synthesis or production of estrogen. It can interfere with sex steroid synthesis, and it can also result in feeling apathetic, helpless or depressed. So this brings us to a fundamental realization or fact, which is that in regards to nervous system health, you want a balance. Both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems have their purposes and roles in health and wellness. So it's really only when the nervous system is out of balance and the person is either sympathetic or parasympathetically dominant that a person experiences health issues. Now getting back to your question about the cholerogenic effects of ashwagandha and ginkgo biloba, I'm assuming that you're referring to studies like this, which discuss how ashwagandha root extract inhibits the production of the enzyme acetylcholine esterase, which is an enzyme that breaks down choline in the body. So when you inhibit the production of this enzyme, choline tends to accumulate in the body, which can obviously stimulate the cholerogenic system or the parasympathetic nervous system. So this study basically confirms that ashwagandha has the ability to inhibit the production of this enzyme, but it doesn't say whether or not it actually activates the cholerogenic system. In fact, ashwagandha is an adaptogenic herb, meaning that it has the ability to either put you in a more parasympathetic or a sympathetic state depending on your unique nervous system or the balance of your biology. And in fact, there's other research that shows that a choline deficiency, which you would think would cause a decreased activity of the cholerogenic system, can actually increase the cholerogenic system in other people. So I think this just goes to show the fact that most substances can be adaptogenic. Take sunlight, for example. Not enough sun can result in a deficiency of vitamin D. It can impair thyroid function and the activation of respiratory enzymes. But too much sun can have an adverse side effect too and cause sunburn and skin damage. This is also true for things like sex. Not getting enough sex can impair the production of steroid hormones. Getting too much of it can impair the production of steroid hormones and increase the production of prolactin and other stress substances. 
So everything, I think, in nature has this sort of adaptogenic effect. There is such a thing as uh, diminishing returns, where too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing, or not enough of a good thing can obviously have adverse side effects too. So when you consider the adaptogenic nature of ashwagandha, this also applies, and I think, to its stimulation, or not, of the cholerogenic system. So keep in mind, as you put, one of the remarkable benefits of ashwagandha is its ability to lower the production of a lot of the adaptive stress substances, so hormones like cortisol. And cortisol, when chronically elevated, has a very interesting effect on the nervous system. So like inescapable stress, when your body is basically unable to cope with the stress, there's a really interesting phenomenon that happens where all of a sudden the body shifts from this parasympathetic sort of stress state to a parasympathetic state and the cholerogenic system is activated. So in other words, very intense stressors that are almost inescapable and nothing can be done about it can actually cause a person to become apathetic, maybe not just mentally, but also physiologically and put a person into this overly parasympathetic state. However, ashwagandha's ability to lower cortisol would in theory at least prevent the body going into this parasympathetically dominant state. But I think for the person that is, let's say, sympathetically dominant, this might be a beneficial thing for ashwagandha to, in a sort of adaptogenic way, take the person who is sympathetically dominant and put them into a more of a sympathetic state, but not overly sympathetic. So keep in mind that I've at least not seen any studies that have confirmed that ashwagandha can directly activate the cholerogenic system. It just inhibits the production of acetylcholine esterase, the enzyme that breaks down choline. And the only studies that I saw about ashwagandha actually stimulating the cholerogenic system are related to ashwagandha leaf, which isn't the same as ashwagandha root. However, ashwagandha root does contain choline, so there's this idea that because it contains choline, maybe it will contribute to an excess of choline in the stimulation of the cholerogenic system. However, keep in mind that the research earlier confirms that there's no direct correlation between excess choline and the excess stimulation of the cholerogenic system, that actually a choline deficiency in ways can stimulate the excess activity of the cholerogenic system in some people. So I don't think you'd have to worry about taking ashwagandha and experiencing adverse side effects in this way unless you're already parasympathetically dominant. If that is the case and you're noticing these effects, it could be due to the fact that ashwagandha has an ability to inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. It acts on one of the serotonin receptors in the body and some people do claim that taking large doses for a long amount of time gives them serotonin syndrome, which is probably not really serotonin syndrome because that's a very extreme condition where you'd probably have to be hospitalized. So it's more likely that ashwagandha and some people who are already parasympathetically dominant, that is making them more parasympathetically dominant. And you can counteract these effects by taking anti-cholerogenic substances like caffeine or coffee, which also keep in mind is an adaptogenic substance as well. So in summary, I don't think you're really going to have to worry about doing anything very intense or extreme if you're supplementing with ashwagandha and ginkgo biloba in a safe or moderate dose and as long as you're not parasympathetic sympathetically dominant. I actually usually recommend pairing these herbs together because of the potential serotonogenic effects of ashwagandha and that ginkgo biloba can mitigate these effects. You might also find that taking about 600 milligrams of rhodiola in combination with ashwagandha can have some balancing effects as well. And if you're really concerned about any possible activation of the cholerogenic system in taking these herbs, then use them in a coffee tonic which is going to have an anti-cholerogenic property and should balance those herbs out. All right, getting to our second question. This question reads, any thoughts on the benefits of consuming raw aloe vera straight from the plant? So I actually made an entire video on that subject on my personal YouTube channel. I'll link that video beneath this video or at the end of the FAQ. So at least according to my research and my personal experience, I think there's tons of benefits to consuming the inner filet of a fresh aloe vera plant or aloe vera leaf. The first thing that comes to mind is its rich content of emodin. So emodin is a compound you'll also find in Hoshu Wu. It supports mitochondrial respiration and energy production. And it also acts as a subtle laxative, which can be very beneficial for people who have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or if they have things like constipation or if they just want to keep their intestines clean. So it has an anti-endotoxin like effect because of this and can be very supportive for not just good bowel health but also good liver health. So I think that this alone makes aloe vera a very beneficial plant. I think most people could benefit from a subtle laxative like that of fresh aloe vera from the inner filet or the leaf or consuming something else with the modin in it like a hoshu wu extract or something like cassagara sagara or senna because a lot of people do have overgrowth of bacteria in their small intestine and because of that have a lot of inflammatory effects or things like hypothyroidism. 
Remember, if your gut is overgrown with bacteria, they're gonna produce inflammatory waste products that can increase the production of nitric oxide, estrogen, serotonin, and histamine, all which oppose good thyroid function and slow down your metabolism. So good digestion is a foundation for good overall health and good thyroid health, which is why we have the perfect digestion course to teach these sort of principles. And I strongly recommend the use of fresh aloe vera for its emodin content alone and the ability to act like a subtle laxative. But there's tons of other really beneficial properties to the fresh aloe vera plant. It also contains natural occurring salicylic acid, which is basically aspirin, which is why when applied topically as a very anti-inflammatory effect applied to the scalp, it can help grow the hair, it can accelerate wound healing, and just the overall regeneration of the skin tissue. And even taking internally, it can have this sort of anti-inflammatory effect. So if you're somebody with leaky gut, taking the aloe vera internally can help soothe any sort of gut inflammation and potentially accelerate the healing or regeneration of the intestinal tissue. It also contains things like sulfur or MSM. It contains a variety of different B vitamins and beneficial polysaccharides as well. So for me, the scientific understanding of the active constituents and the physiological effect of the chemicals in aloe vera have been incentive for me to experiment with it. And in my personal experience, I've only ever found positive benefits from taking it. However, like any other herb or food, everybody's gonna react a bit differently. So the only way to truly know if it's gonna be beneficial is to experiment with it. And like anything else, I'd recommend starting off slow. You know, do a little bit of aloe vera, apply it to your skin and see if you notice improvements in any sort of skin conditions. I noticed that the regular use of it can help get rid of acne and blemishes and redness almost overnight. Uh, one time I cut my finger pretty bad, my thumb, almost down to the bone. And all I did was put my thumb in an aloe vera filet, like I just stuck it into the meat and I slept with it overnight I woke up and it was sealed so I do know it has this very powerful wound uh, accelerating effect and the ability to regenerate the skin tissue that might have a lot to do with the various polysaccharides in it from my understanding but also the salicylic acid and other anti-inflammatory compounds in it it might also have something to do with the emodin I noticed that it does keep your digestive system very smooth and regulated and through doing that has a beneficial effect on your skin and overall health. I'm not aware of any negative side effects that could come from taking it. Some people claim that the emodin has a toxic like effect and too much of it can you know induce loose stool or diarrhea. I've never had that experience unless you're taking just straight aloe vera juice in a concentrated or unnatural form but taking the whole herb or the whole inner filet has only been beneficial for me. I just blend it into a smooth smoothie and just take the amount that I feel necessary. So I just encourage that you experiment for yourself and see what you find out. All right, guys, that brings this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday to a close. If we didn't answer your question and you want some more one-on-one -on -one direct assistance, be sure to check out our Patreon, which we just launched, where you can enroll in monthly one-on-one -on -one coaching, where you can email us questions anytime, an unlimited amount, and we'll be responding to those every day by the end of the day. Also, if you're just interested in learning more information beyond this YouTube channel, we do have an online wellness academy where we offer a wide variety of online courses. Uh, if you're not yet aware, we are still in the pre-launch phase or promotion of our Perfect Thyroid course. So we're offering about a 75% discount on that course. And that promotional price is going to be ending in a couple of days by Monday. And the course will be launched either on Monday or the very latest March 1st, but likely sooner. So if you've been interested in our information regarding how to improve thyroid health, that course is a must. And you're going to want to grab a seat while they're available and why that promotional discount is still available. Otherwise, again, for learning beyond this YouTube channel, we have additional information and resources on our website, on our blog, and our tonic herb shop. All of this you can find in the description box below. And for those of you interested in winning some free herbs or mushrooms, remember all you have to do to be entered to win is subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet already, give this video a thumbs up, and then just leave a comment or question in the comment section below.